Hi, I'm John White, author of What You Don't Know About Listening Could Fill a Book, and you're watching Eye on Business. Well, hello, everybody. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. Today's subject is a great one. Can your lawyer destroy a good business deal? Over the years in business, as a member of over 40 boards, I've received good advice, sometimes great advice, from corporate attorneys, and on occasion, bad advice as well. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, there's a line that should be drawn in a relationship between corporate attorneys and the CEO or the board. Attorneys are paid to protect the corporation, not to give business advice. Well, some are experienced enough to provide great business advice, but be careful. The law degree they earn doesn't assure that, even though the most CEOs respect the advice they receive from their attorneys, high enough not to doubt the conclusions or the experience behind the conclusions offered, be a little careful. Since attorneys are paid to protect, often they'll give you a litany of warnings about what could go wrong when accepting a contract clause that they've been trained to challenge. There comes a time when a CEO must decide to reject what may seem like important good advice from the attorney or chance acceptance of terms within a contract that could cause risk, but controllable risk, or risk that is so remote as to be worth the acceptance of the business represented by the contract at hand. I was a chairman of a company that had offered an investment by a Fortune 500 company, making a strategic investment in the business. It would have been a series of great opportunities, creating a new web service and a greater need for the company's products. The business terms had been arranged between the business development officer of the investing company and among our board, as both companies turned the details over to their respective attorneys for documentation. The attorney for the investor was a member of a large, respected law firm in Silicon Valley, not going to mention the name, and certainly was full of himself as the sole legal protector of the rights of his very significant investor. As drafts of the otherwise standard investment passed from him to our attorney and our management, we immediately spotted a significant number of terms we didn't like and we hadn't agreed to, but were contrary to the spirit of the investment. Well, their attorney held fast in defending every challenge, stating that, quote, these terms are standard for our client and can't be changed, unquote. We appealed to the business development executive of that company, who deferred to the attorney again, restating that the terms were unchangeable as far as the big company was concerned. After conferring between our attorney and board, we walked away from what would have been a fine strategic partnership killed by an attorney who probably understood the client requirements, but was unwilling to offer flexible solutions to those kind of product areas. That attorney had made what we consider business decisions on behalf of his client. By the way, we immediately found a willing replacement that had an attorney not quite so full of himself and quickly concluded a similar deal to the acceptance of all. And to this day, I caution my CEOs on boards where I am not to deal with that Fortune 500 firm because of the experience we have with that attorney. You just never know how far-reaching an action can be given the speed and extent of communication between CEOs today. Well, that's my story. I know that you probably have a story similar to that. Love to hear it sometime. Well, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. See you next time. Hi, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. And at the end of 2017, I published a book called Street Savvy Business, A Way to Prevent Corporate Mediocrity. It's based upon these 
uh, interviews, uh, the TV show, and my consulting practice. It's really down to earth, practical, good advice, tools, techniques, and uh, methodologies that could easily be applied to your business, be you a, be you a startup or a small company, a medium-sized company, or even large companies. Uh, it's available on Amazon uh, as a Kindle edition or in a paperback and also on lulu.com. Hope you enjoy it, and if you do, please write a review. Thank you very much. I'm Chelsea Lee, CEO of Shipsy, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. And tonight we have a special guest. We have the CEO and founder of a brand new company called Shipsy. Welcome, Chelsea Lee. Hi, thank you. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, uh, build, getting the idea for the business and then putting that idea into reality. Mm -hmm. So before we do that, tell us a little about yourself. I grew up in Minnesota in a small town uh, outside of the city and love to travel and since become addicted to anything in technology, anything in retail, anything building a brand. All right. So I'm, I'm sure now that you're in Southern California, you miss those warm winters up in Minnesota. Desperately. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so now in Minnesota, uh, there's a large client, I think, called Target or Best Buy. More Fortune 500 companies than in any other state in the U.S., actually. All right. So did you get the idea for Shipsy out of one of these large companies and their need for doing something uniquely different? Uh, not necessarily. It was sort of working with anyone from a Bob's Bait shop to Nike and everything in between, and everyone was trying to figure out how to meet the needs of today's consumers and this instant gratification that they're seeking. Uh, so my, co my now co-founder was a good friend of mine, and we played around with the idea a little bit and developed a solution for it. All right, so now we've, we've intrigued the audience. What is this business? What is Shipsy? Uh, so let's, let's um, discuss. What is Shipsy? Yeah, we partner with brands and retailers and allow them to operate like Amazon, but on their own and 23 hours faster. Uh, but you offer something unique that Amazon kind of doesn't do, but kind of is doing, and you offer a instant, almost an instant delivery mm -hmm. service. I mean, you're not Absolutely. transporting something like mm -hmm. in Star Trek, but right. tell us about that. Yeah, so we partner with any brand or retailer, integrate into their e-commerce platform. There's standard shipping options that they would have today, and then there's also an additional option at checkout when a geographic criteria is met, where the SKU is, where the customer is, and where an available last mile delivery driver is. When that criteria is met, you get another option to receive your merchandise in 20 minutes or 35 minutes. And what we're finding is that maybe overnight is... $40 for you to get a new shirt, uh, but you can get it in 30 minutes for 20 bucks. All right. So if I'm playing in a tennis tournament and I have put a hole in my shoe because I was doing so well, yes. then yes. Uh, I would be able to call up my tennis shop, Strings, yes. and they would be able to use you, I select that option, and they would deliver me a new tennis shoe set. Exactly. And then you just well, won, like won the match. Uh, yeah, because I have more string in my feet. Yes, yeah, I, I, yes. I get that part. <laughs> All right. So... Tell me who the actual target market is. Is it the consumer, uh, the millennials who mm -hmm. seem to like instant gratification? Is it the seniors who don't want to be bothered by going to the store? Well, mm -hmm. in Minnesota, you wouldn't want to go out anyway. Not so really. I guess there it would be real popular. Yeah. Or is it the retailers? So our customer is a brand or a retailer that has an existing website that they can sell online. And then we're satisfying the needs of the end consumer. Uh, so it's really anyone who wants to order something and doesn't want to wait for it. In today's society, we order something online to save time or we don't want to run out to the store, but then we wait days to get it. We're breaking that and really bringing a new rate at retail. Yeah, but would you look at, here's, here's the question. Would I look at a small business? Mm -hmm. I'm running out of toner ink. I need to be able to get that. I can see an immediacy for that. Yep. Or am I looking for somebody that needs to, you know, because millennials like my kids, you know, they may want to wait till the last minute and say, wow, I need a shirt for this wedding tomorrow yeah. or today. You know, I need to get it now. Yeah. Who is really the audience? Is it a small business, a business, or is it a, um, a, a specific type of consumer? So we asked the market, actually, and the answers were quite comical. It was everything from a Bluetooth speaker, a pair of, of, of socks or shoes or a tie. This is a family-oriented show, so I just want to make sure you don't <laughs> do anything strange here. Uh, we, we received some very interesting answers, and I, I will share the, the full list with you at some point. Yeah, okay. Well, that would be really interesting. Yes. All right, so we know the target market. Now, what's your business model? How do you make money? Yeah, so when partnering with brands or retailers, it's a monthly subscription or a traditional SaaS 
business model with an implementation, but then we also have warehouse partners and logistics partners that we have a revenue share partnership with. If uh, you're making ties and you need a different logistics provider or warehouse to keep it because your business is growing so so large so quickly, great, well, we can make a recommendation for you on right. a new warehouse or logistics partner and then um, also with our partners of NetSuite, Oracle, SAP, we also do a, a revenue share with them. Now, why wouldn't I use, or why, as a retailer, mm -hmm. why wouldn't I go to Uber and use Uber Fast? Mm -hmm. Have you ever worked in a buying office? Um, I did on the services side. Okay. Uh, you know, they definitely could. I don't know if they want to spend their time with their buyers and planners ordering Ubers or uh, figuring out where to pick it up or the locations, but really the... The magic behind what we're doing in the API is that algorithm of the geographic location of where the SKU is, where the customer is, and an available logistics or transportation partner. Maybe Uber's not available, but Postmates is. So we're combining and aggregating all of that data and giving it to the end consumer as an option. So you're like the Trivago of, <laughs> of, of yeah. delivery. Yeah, because absolutely. Because you may use Uber, you may use Lyft, you may use Postmates mm -hmm. or any other yeah. local delivery service, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's great. And now you're in the current process of raising capital, right? Yes. How is that going? It's interesting. Uh, I remember yeah. the, <laughs> the first time uh, I was told no, I uh, called my, my co-founder, Ben Way, and said, Ben, they said no. Right. And he said, It's only okay, one time. Who do, you have, who do you have this afternoon? Who else is right, next? Right, right, right. And I, I was on the phone with him, and I said, I don't think that you understand. They said no. This concept it was a whole new thing for me. So it's, it's been a very humbling process. Um, and uh, I'm, very, I'm very thankful for it for a lot of reasons. But it's difficult to get an investor to put their money where their mouth is. And we're, we're rapidly growing, and the market is obviously there. So get on the train or, or don't. Well, I think, you're doing, I think you're doing great. And I think your personality should at least get, and the way your passion for this uh, should get some really good traction. By the way, when you look at companies like Uber, I think they had 40 rejections before somebody said, wow, what a neat idea. It's different uh -huh. than, so being disruptive is very, very difficult to sell sometimes. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, let, me, let me ask you for the final question. Three things that are takeaways from your experience as a founding CEO. Yeah, I would say, uh, number one, listen to your team and what, what they need and what their strengths are. Okay. Uh, and the consumer, so listening. Also be disciplined uh, in everything that you do. Time is so valuable. Right. Uh, and number three, when, when someone says you can't, watch me. Yeah, and, and I, I will watch you because <laughs> I know that if they, that's only the start of the conversation. You said no today, well, let's talk tomorrow. Yes. And I, I, I can believe that. Chelsea, Absolutely. that was great to have you as Thank a guest. You. I appreciate it, and I wish you and Shipsy the best in uh, success. Thank you. May you be the next unicorn. There we go. All right. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Hope you got something out of it. Hope you enjoyed the show. Have a good evening. Hi, I'm Adrian Pelkis. I'm the president of A Square Technologies, and you are watching Ion Business. Hello, everybody. I am Eric Huber. I'm a special guest host today for Ion Business. I'm real excited to have uh, my friend on my, uh, my show today. And that is Adrian Pelkis. Adrian, welcome. Thank Here. you for making the drive. Thank you. Um, Adrian has a company, a product development company called A Squared Technologies. Correct. Product development engineering firm. Um, he is on the board of directors of a political advocacy group called U.S. Inventor. He is uh, on the board of directors with me for United Inventors Association. And he runs one of the largest, most uh, prestigious um, inventor groups in the nation called San Diego Inventors Forum. Welcome. Indeed. Well, thank you very much. So tell us a little bit more about you. You've got so many things that go on <laughs> that you've done. It's crazy. Well, the, uh, the main business is product development and assembly. We have a plant in San Marcos, and we've been doing this for over 35 years. So the accumulation is over 300 products we've helped develop. And, uh, and help inventors launch their businesses. Actually, over a dozen businesses we've helped get started from the work we've done at A-Squared. Right. So that's the main aspect. The, uh, the club that you mentioned is, is a passion of mine, this uh, San Diego Inventors Forum. Uh, I've been doing this now for about 13 years, and uh, we have about 1,400 on our mailing list. Our regular meetings are about 30 to 70 people, depending on the topic. 
and our mission is to motivate, educate, and network inventors to become successful entrepreneurs that create jobs. Great. It's all about creating jobs. So. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Now, something else, too, that I found very interesting is um, the uh, Mars City Design Competition. Right. Tell us a little bit about that and the success that you've had in that competition. Oh, well, yes, it's a diversion, actually, but it's a fun one. Uh, it's uh, so much work in real life, and uh, some of it is serious, and actually, I'm very blessed and happy I, I am so free to create things and help people create things uh, but it, 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 there's a, a gnawing need always to invent in, in my mind and uh, this was a great avenue for us for, for me I was uh, introduced to the group a couple of years ago by the founder uh, Vera Mulani who herself is a uh, very passionate uh, Mars architect She's an architect that like wants it. to do things on Mars. Wow. Uh, and uh, yes, in fact, she created this group and they held a contest a couple of years ago, which uh, I, I took, I love the idea of, let's do something creative. Mm -hmm. So I had two entries. I actually entered in a uh, device that was a robot that would pick up regolith, as it's called, and uh, center it in place and, and print walls, mm -hmm. thinking, you know, we can send robots up and build these things before we get there. Uh, and the other thing I uh, applied uh, and, and showed uh, was a, a device called a mood adjuster. Mm -hmm. And it uh, measures a lot of your uh, uh, physical reactions, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, your uh, pulse rate and heart rate and eyes, and it measures you in a number of ways to determine what your mood actually is. What's unique about it is that in real time, it will actually administer treatments, different modalities. So you get a whole slew of things. It's not just a pair of visual glasses. We're talking about heart rate variability mm -hmm. and signals and, and touching, smells. We can, we can hit most of your senses. And then in real time, we can measure how they're actually affecting you. So the idea is we're going to have some great astronauts going to Mars, but they might have a few issues that uh, uh, a little extra help would, would, would certainly be sure. important to have. So. I just love that. And, and there's so much, there's a lot of fun being an inventor. I mean, we, we get to play with things, we get to come up with these ideas, and sometimes we get to see them become um, something on the shelves, and, and that's very yeah. exciting. But there's also a lot of serious things going on right now in yeah. not just the independent inventor community, but for us as a country, yeah. and that is the patent system and how our patent system has changed. Mm -hmm. And on the international landscape, we have gone, I believe, from number one to number 12 yes. in terms of our our IP system, our intellectual property system. Yeah. And so there's some real issues out there. Tell us a little bit about what you have been working tirelessly, I know traveling and doing so <laughs> much to bring the attention to Congress and to others mm -hmm. about this situation. Tell mm -hmm. us how is it broken? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a moment ago we were talking about the fun and joy of inventing, which is, in fact, being creative and accomplishing something and making something that you've envisioned turn into reality, or maybe somebody else has envisioned it, but you've, you've had that goal and you've, you've succeeded, and that is a great reward, that accomplishment of going mm -hmm. from just a concept to reality. Uh, and in this country, it was the basis for the start of our country. In, in regards to our Constitution, when our four founders came to this country, Eric, they left a nation that King George ruled everything. And it doesn't matter how great an idea you had, he owned it. Yeah. Our forefathers came to this country going, that's not really incentivizing anybody. Why don't we let people have a temporary monopoly on things and, and profit from the labors of their mind yeah. was the essence of the idea. So in Section 1, Article, it's in uh, the Constitution, it's Article 1, Section 8. Mm -hmm. It's written that it guarantees our rights to uh, have patents, a property right, so we can, in fact, create businesses and create jobs. And this was, our forefathers knew this was the way, and it worked beautifully for 220-something years. Mm -hmm. It worked beautifully. We, our patent system was the greatest job creator on this planet. Mm -hmm. We were number one. We were number one in innovation. We were number one in a lot of things. And what's happened in the last decade, especially in the last administration, was they enacted a couple of laws that have devastated the patent system in favor of the larger corporations' benefits. So we have, uh, we're facing this law called American Events Act that is the whole culmination of, of a number of regulations and rules that have really, really been hurting uh, the small inventor, especially all in favor of the bigger, larger corporations. So some examples. The first one that came about that they were promoting was the, the meekest of all of them was a simple change in a wording saying, well, it's instead of first to invent, it's first mm -hmm. inventor to file. 
But that small change made it so that the consequence is that you can't go talk to people openly now and just rely on having a notebook that somebody signed to say you invented something. You have to protect your IP. You have to file now, provisionals at least, before you start the path of trying to raise money, trying to show it off, a focus group, God forbid, you go out out of time and somebody unscrupulous can now go over the computer, claim they invented it, it, it it's who's getting to the computer first with $65 and filling out the paperwork. So that was the first factor that was uh, brought up, and that's how uh, a lot of our congressmen were promoting this bill on mm -hmm. the weakest element of it. But what was behind it was a whole number of other of series of things. Um, the one I have the most concern about is we have now, because of a precedent called Alice, changed patent laws to not, you cannot patent anymore an idea, a uh, patent idea that has what's called an abstract idea. And unfortunately, they never defined what an abstract idea is. Mm -hmm. But what it's applied to is basically anywhere with so anything with software hmm. as an overall rule. So uh, everything we have in our world nowadays is running off of software. Mm -hmm. So the consequence is, if you saw the news today, China has the lead on AI advance in, in investments. We don't. A artificial intelligence, medical devices, communications, transportation, all these things are going to be software, Jeez. if not already software driven. And we're losing the edge on all of this because our own patent system isn't allowing it. Last year, they disallowed a MRI machine from getting a patent because they said it was an abstract idea. Jeez. Yeah, and this this is a big issue, and we and this is a very complicated. Yet it does it gets very simple. It is a very simple issue, and it affects all of us. And you talk about jobs and the economy. Absolutely. This is something that is has and will continue to really affect us. Right. And um, I, I'd love to have you back because there is so much we can talk about going to Washington D.C. How we can help out. Yeah. Um, but I would like you, if you could, give us give us one bit of wisdom. The new inventor out there, the person who has just come up with the idea, what what advice would you give them? Uh, we talk about this regularly at the Inventors Forum, and the number one key is we have 70,000 ideas a day, so uh, jot down the idea that you think is important. Because mm -hmm. just not even capturing the idea is the number one mistake inventors make is you didn't capture the idea. Right. Uh, and I'll give you two more just because it's, it's worth it. Okay, yeah. Patent search your ideas. Don't reinvent somebody else's wheel and, sure. and, and, and get all this. And then number three, the power of a focus group can make or mm. break you. A uh, focus group is uh, the difference between a million-dollar product and a million-dollar loss. Mm. So there's your Great. elemental threes. And we can, they can get a hold of you at sdinventors.com? Dot org. Dot org, yes, sorry. That's, dot org. Our, that's our 504c3. We are activists Great. in Washington fighting for inventors' rights, indeed. Or my company is CaliforniaProductDevelopers.com. Great. Great. Thank you very much. You're so very welcome, Eric. So appreciate you coming and telling us about this situation. Uh, again, this is Eric Huber with Eye on Business.